Yes, the signs are clearly marked. Yep, so just go if you need to go. Or wait till the end of the mission. That's always, that's always good. <laughs> All right, so sit back, relax, enjoy the wonderful show that you all come to this day. Thank you. The registered and burial sama, the clergyman, the, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was put upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doorman. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was the sole executor, the sole administrator, the sole assigned, the sole residuary legatee, the sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Molly's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There was no doubt that Molly was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come from the story I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Adam's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable than him taking a stroll at night, in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts, than in any other middle-aged gentleman, rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, saying St. Paul's Churchyard, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Oh, boy. 
Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out of all Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time of paying bills without money? A time to find yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. A time for balancing your boots and having every item in it from a round dozen of one presented dead against you. If I could work my will, every idiot that goes round with Merry Christmas on his lips should be born with his own body and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way. And let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good may do you. Much good it has ever done you. There have been many times which I have tried to by which I have not told you. I dare say Christmas among the rest. <laughs> I have always loved Christmas time when it comes around. A part of the veneration due to its sacred name and origin. As a good time, a kind forgiving charitable time. The only time I know in a long calendar the year when men and women seem by right to consent to open the shut up hearts to them. And to think of people who them as fellow passengers of the grave, fresh as a race of creatures bound on their journeys. And therefore, Uncle, don't accept for a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket. I believe it has done me good, and it will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless it indeed, that God bless it indeed. But here I'll well, send from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you go with to Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come and dine with us tomorrow. Dine with us indeed. Why did you get married? Because I said I know. Because you fell in love, good afternoon. Nay, hey, Uncle, but you never gave us reasons for not coming to see me yet. Why give you reasons for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I have come in the homage of Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas in love. Alas, so a merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a happy new year. Good afternoon. <laughs> a merry Christmas, Bob. A Merry Christmas to Mrs. Bridget and all of the Bridget's as well. Oh, thank you very much, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. I'll get you the door. There is another fellow, my clerk, 15 shillings a week, and a wife and family, talking about a Merry Christmas. I'll retire to bed. This lunatic who's The brakes, the shops, where holly sprigs and bays crack and the landscape. 
You'll be wanting all day tomorrow then, I suppose. If it's all convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient, and it's not fair. Perhaps I'll stop you half a crown for anything yourself ill use, I'll be bound. And yet you don't think me ill use when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's, it's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking hands pockets every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Yes, sir, all the earlier. I promise. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 sorry. Thank you again, sir. A oh, Merry Christmas to you. Scrooge lived in Park, in an apartment to once belong to his deceased partner. They were in gloomy spirit of room. Now, isn't that there is nothing all particular about the knock on the door, except that it is very large? It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and day during his whole residence in that place. Also, that he had little what is called fancy bedroom as any man in the city of London. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge not so one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge. Here's Scrooge now. Yeah, sir. Ah. Let any man explain to me, if he can, how Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw the knocker without it undergoing any intermediate process of change. Not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not as impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were. It had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as marvelous to look. With its ghostly spectacles, it turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That and its livid color made it horrible. For his horse seemed to be in spite of its face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of the terrible sensation, to it had been a strange from infancy, would be untrue. When he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sternly, walked in, and lit his hand. Thank you. 